before you speak, we have Abby, who's going to be talking about something very linked to this topic. Hi, so, um, I'm not Pinky Patchell, I'm Abby Whelan, <laughs> I'm in the middle six, and we're starting something that doesn't really have a name yet, but it's going to be an LGBTQ, an allies group, so you don't have to be gay to come along, you don't have to be straight, you can be anyone, and it's open to anyone and everyone. And hopefully we're going to run, have discussions and talks and presentations about <laughs> gender and sexuality that anyone can come and get involved in and maybe learn a little and just talk about it because it's something that needs to be talked about. And if anyone's, in it, if anyone's interested in helping to run it, um, I'm kind of looking for sixth form here, then let me know. I'll be mentioning it again in chapel on Thursday. But we're probably going to meet on Friday break or lunch. So yeah, I thought I'd mention it because it's important that we talk about these things and I'm really excited. So yeah, thank you. Well, thanks very much. It's really great to join you here today. I was asked to speak on the theme of why LGBT issues should concern you. Regardless of your sexuality, regardless of your gender identity, LGBT issues matter to every single one of you. So let's get the terminology. Um, LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Then there's also intersex, pansexual, asexual, lots of different variations. And they are all equally valid. But I'm just going to use the short term LGBT or LGBT+. Plus. So I guess one of the questions I'm often asked is, why are some people LGBT? To which I reply, strange that you ask that question. Why don't you ask why some people are straight? Um, how come there's this interest, this fascination with why some people like others of the same gender? But having said that, let's look at the potential reasons. And the potential reasons are the same for heterosexuality, homosexuality, and bisexuality. Um, the indications are from the scientific research that probably our genetic inheritance from our parents accounts for half or more of our sexual orientation. Whether we're gay or straight, genetic markers are key influences on our sexual orientation. Um, the reason we can say that with a fair degree of confidence is that if you look at the general population, it's calculated that roughly about 5 to 10 percent of the population are or will be attracted to a person of the same sex at some point in their life. Maybe not all their life, but maybe for a period. 5 to 10 percent. But when you get identical twins, that is, twins who have identical genetic material, when one twin is gay, in more than 50% of cases, the other twin is also gay. So that would indicate that genes play a significant role. And it's further evidenced by the fact that in non-identical <coughs> twins, that is, who may share a significant proportion, but not a totality, of same DNA. In that case, where one twin is gay, in about 20 to 25 percent of cases, the other twin will also be gay. But then in general families, say between brothers or between sisters, who are not twins, identical or non-identical, then the ratio goes down to the standard average of five to ten percent. So that's pretty strong evidence that genes play a very major significant role in both heterosexuality and homosexuality. But the other big factor is hormones in the womb. When we are a fetus in our mother's womb, hormones in the womb will also impact on our sexual orientation or and or gender identity. And how do we know that? Because we can see differences in physical attributes 
between heterosexual men and gay men and between heterosexual women and gay women. So for example, uh, when it comes to um, finger ratios, uh, the ratio between this finger and this finger, the, this finger, the index and the uh, ring finger, it is on average different between gay and straight men. And we know that this ratio is influenced by hormones in the womb. So for example, um, when it comes to gay and bisexual men, on average there will be a different ratio in proportion of size between these two fingers. But it's only an average. So for example, I'm gay, but my ratio indicates that I'm supposed to be straight. So it's only an average, it's not a, a, a cast iron universal rule. Um, we also know, if we can get a little bit explicit, uh, and I hate to embarrass our straight friends here, but on average, gay men have larger penises. Um, <laughs> uh, when it comes to women, um, on the whole, lesbian women tend to have a larger body mass than straight women. They also have differences in their auditory capacity. So there are certain in indicators in their hearing which are different from straight women. And again, penis size, body mass, auditory perception, finger ratios, these are all things that are influenced by hormonal factors in the womb. And then if you add on top of that, cultural expectations are also a very significant factor. So it's very likely that if we live in a completely non-homophobic, non-biophobic, non-transphobic society, a much higher proportion of the population would have same-sex attraction and experiences. Because of the social pressure to conform, because heterosexuality is seen as the norm, because there's prejudice against LGBT people, a lot of straight people <coughs> repress their same-sex desires. So for example, in some indigenous cultures in the Pacific or Africa or other places, um, there's traditionally been the expectation that all young boys will go through a phase of same-sex attraction and relationship, usually during their teenage years. That's normal, it's a normal expectation. So in those societies, nearly all boys do. But of course, in our society, and in very homophobic societies, that is not the expectation. So even people who may have a same-sex attraction will be reluctant to acknowledge it or express it. I'll come back to that a bit more later on. All I'm saying is that peer pressure and cultural expectations are also factors. So I mentioned that um, the statistical average in societies across the world, fairly universal, is that roughly 5 to 10% of the population will be LGBT for all or part of their lives. Um, but of course, that is beginning to change. An Observer poll, the Observer newspaper, has done a series of polls over recent years looking at young people's sexuality and behavior. And it's found that among young people aged 16 to 24, 23% had had a same-sex experience. That's almost one in four. 25 in 100 have actually had a same-sex experience. That's a very high proportion, much higher than the 5 to 10% average. There was a YouGov poll in 2015 of a similar demographic, um, 16 to 24-year-olds, which asked them, would you define your sexuality as 100% straight, 100% heterosexual? 49% said no. 49% of young people in this country, in a properly balanced sample of the population, aged 16 to 24, said they would not regard themselves as 100% straight. Therefore, acknowledging the possibility, potential, or even the desire, that they may have a same-sex attraction. So we can see that as Britain becomes a more liberal accepting society, more people feel able to acknowledge and accept and perhaps even express 
their same-sex attractions. Now let's look back at the history of all this. Um, way back, well over a century ago, uh, the great psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud theorized that uh, homosexuality and bisexuality, <coughs> as well as heterosexuality, were part of the natural human constitution. That if it wasn't for religion and cultural pressure, peer pressure, then everybody would acknowledge and potentially express both opposite sex and same-sex attraction. He was based on his studies of his patients. He was surprised how many under intensive counseling and analysis did admit to having <coughs> same-sex attraction. So he concluded that bisexuality is constitutional to the human condition. That we all have a bisexual potential. Then in the 1940s, Sigmund Freud was further developed by Dr. Alfred Kinsey in the United States, who did a massive survey of both male and female behavior. And in these studies, which involved thousands and thousands of men for one study and thousands and thousands of women for the other study, he found that far from being two mutually exclusive sexualities, heterosexuality and homosexuality, sexuality was actually a spectrum where people had a mix, the average person had a mix of both heterosexual and homosexual desires. So he was suggesting that no one or very few people are 100% straight or 100% gay. And he found that of men that he surveyed, and I think he surveyed nearly 20,000 men, he found that nearly 40% had had a same sex experience to the point of orgasm. Nearly 40%. In some cases it was only just a one-off experience, but nearly 40%. He found that 25% had significant and ongoing same-sex attractions and experiences. He found that 50% had homoerotic desires, many of which they had not acted upon, but they had them there and they acknowledged them. So his suggestion was that we're on a spectrum, that most of us are somewhere in the middle between, or varying degrees along the spectrum of 100% straight, 100% gay. Now, of course, there are some people who are totally straight and totally gay, but they're a very small minority. And the more those people feel relaxed and comfortable talking about and thinking about these issues, the more likely they are to admit that they have sexual and emotional feelings for a person of the same gender. Um, in the 1970s, uh, two American sexologists continued Kinsey's work. They were Masters and Johnson. Um, they concluded from all their studies, uh, as Freud did, as Kinsey did, that same-sex attraction was one aspect of the natural diversity of human sexuality. Same-sex attraction is just a fundamental part of what it is to be human. But because of political, religious, family, and other pressures, most people don't express it. They also found, interestingly, that when it came to sexual experiences, um, same-sex couples had a much higher ratio of sexual diversity um, in terms of their sexual practices. Um, Gay couples and lesbian couples were much more sexually adventurous. They did more things. They took longer over sex. They did longer foreplay, longer after play. And they had a much, much higher level of sexual satisfaction compared to the average heterosexual couple. So I think the um, research found that the average length of making love for two men was about 30 minutes. The average length of making love for two women was about 50 minutes, and the average length of making love for a man and a woman was about 10 minutes. <laughs> um, then in, in the 1960s, um, 
two very famous anthropologists, Ford and Beach, they published a book called Patterns of Sexual Behavior. And they looked at pre-capitalist tribal societies around the world, mostly in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Ocean. And they looked at 76 studies, in-depth studies of these societies. And they found that in two-thirds of them, not only was same-sex behavior prevalent, but it was also either accepted or tolerated. So, for example, in some South Pacific islands, men who are attracted to men or men who are gender non-conformist, who are perhaps effeminate, they are not seen as bad people. They're actually accepted as part of the culture. And in some cases, they're given revered social roles. Um, so, for example, particularly in North American native indigenous tribes, um, often the shaman, the holy man of the tribe, that will be assigned to a, a two-spirit man. A two-spirit man is the name given to what we would call a gay man. But this is regarded as a special, unique thing. Something venerated, something valued, and this person is the custodian of the tribal history, the person who is the custodian of all the medicinal secrets of the tribe, the custodian of all the rituals. So it's a very different approach to sexuality compared to modern Western society. So we've talked about human sexual diversity, but what about animal sexual diversity? Now, there's a very famous book published called Biological Exuberance by Bruce Bagamil, uh, published by Profile Books uh, about 20 years ago. This book brought together the 400 major studies of animal species. Everything from lions to dolphins to seagulls to monkeys to snakes. It brought together all these different studies where a particular animal species had been studied very exhaustively and in depth. And it found same-sex relations existed in every single one of these animal species. Uh, it existed among giraffes, lions, bears, eagles, whales. Again, they came to the conclusion this is part of the natural spectrum of animal sexuality. And of course, we humans are animals. We, we are part of the animal species. A particularly unique part, but we are part of animal species. And all these other species share with us this capacity, this practice of same-sex attraction. If we look at the attempts to eradicate homosexuality, and there's been many, many attempts in history. So, in medieval England, um, men who had sex with men were burned alive at the stake. Burned alive at the stake. Um, during the Nazi era, in the Second World War, the run-up, Adolf Hitler had a program for the eradication of homosexuality. The total extermination of same-sex relations. On a par with his bid to exterminate Jewish people. But even the medieval burnings of gay men even the Nazi extermination policy did not stop homosexuality. It did not succeed. Today in Iran, um, they have a policy. If you are gay, you can be executed, you can be put to death, you can be hanged for being gay in Iran today. But that has not eradicated homosexuality. In fact, much to the shock of the Iranian leaders, um, they did a survey a few years ago of young people. Um, they were concerned that young people were becoming restless and oppositional to the clerical regime. That the young people wanted freedom, wanted the right to be themselves. And so they said, we, ha we have to investigate young people to establish what they're thinking and feeling and what they're doing so that we can stop these bad ideas and these bad practices. So one of the questions they asked a huge sample of university and high school students was, have you ever had a same-sex experience? Now at this time, the then president of Iran, Ahmad, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, 
went to the United Nations and claimed there were no gay people in Iran. That it, you know, they would be killed if they were found, but there were none. But much to the shock of the researchers, they discovered that 17% of Iranian high school students and university students said they'd had a same-sex experience. 17%, even though doing so carried the risk of arrest, trial, conviction, and execution. So you can see that attempts to eradicate homosexuality do not work. And if this was just something, you know, of insignificance, of course the repression would work. Of course homosexuality wouldn't survive. But obviously it's intrinsic to our humanity, and therefore despite this repression, it does. Um, even today there are attempts in this country and other countries to so-called cure homosexuality. Uh, most of these are driven by religious fundamentalists who think that you can pray away the gay or you can do an exorcism to get rid of homosexuality and so on. Um, again, it doesn't work. It's hugely damaging and it doesn't work. I used to work about 30 years ago with an organization called the Courage Trust. When I say work with, I actually worked against them. They were Christian fundamentalists who regard homosexuality as a terrible sin. And their objective was to take gay men and turn them straight. So they had a program where they had um, safe houses dotted around the country where a person who was gay would reside for several months. And in these safe houses, um, uh, no one was allowed to be in a room with another person of the same gender unsupervised. So they were basically under surveillance by other uh, people, mostly staff, pretty much 24 hours a day. Um, it, this, this was so extreme that, um, for example, one of the houses was in Hertfordshire and some of the people in these houses had family uh, living on the south coast in, in Southampton and uh, places like that. And every now and then they were allowed to go home for a weekend to visit their family. But the Courage Trust insisted they were not allowed to travel through London because it was regarded as a den of homosexuality and that people might be tempted if they travelled through London to go to a gay bar or club. So they have to construct a very convoluted route to get to Southampton without going through the obvious route down to London and then to Southampton. Anyway, the Courage Trust tried these conversion therapies for 20 years and then to their great credit, they had a moment of realization. Firstly, it wasn't working. And secondly, it was actually causing people great sexual and emotional harm. People didn't get cured of the homosexuality. They did suppress it somewhat. But they felt unhappy. They felt miserable. They got depressed. Some of them even became suicidal. So in the end, the Courage Trust said, we tried this. It doesn't work, it causes damage, we're going to stop. We're now going to help people come to terms with their sexuality. And that's what they do today. Instead of trying to cure the gay, they help gay people adjust and accept themselves. So it's a great example of a positive change of policy. Um, I don't know if you're all familiar with the statistics in schools. Um, the National Survey of LGBT Kids Across Britain has found that 45% have been bullied at school. Mostly bullied by other pupils, but sometimes even by staff members. This ranges from name calling to threats, menaces, and even actual physical assaults. 45%. Among young trans kids, the level is much higher, and in fact, nearly 50% of trans pupils in British schools have attempted suicide because of rejection by their parents and bullying at school. That's really, really shocking. So it shows that we need a big, big change of attitudes and mentality in our schools. Uh, when it comes to outside the school environment, one third, no, sorry, 40% of all LGBT people in Britain have been the victims of homophobic 
biphobic or transphobic hate crime at least once in their lives, and if they're older, perhaps three, four, or five times. Um, people get beaten up coming out of gay clubs, get beaten up outside their homes, get beaten up in the street, going to the shops. One third, that's nearly one million LGBT people who've been victims of anti-LGBT hate crime. So let's think about homophobia. We've talked a lot about homosexuality. Let's think about homophobia. People often ask, why are people homophobic? It's a very interesting question. Instead of asking, why are people gay, why are people homophobic? Well, there's an American professor, Henry Adams, at the University of Georgia, who about 20 years ago decided to test out the reasons. And he um, based his premise on some ideas that Sigmund Freud had, that often we displace and project onto other people our own internal fears that we can't accept. So if we're afraid and fearful of something, and we think that we might be gay, we actually turn that around and express that as hatred of other gay people. Partly because we can't accept that, and partly because we don't want anybody to suspect that we're gay, so we act in an anti-gay way to deflect suspicion. So what he did was, he got a representative sample of men, he only studied men, and he gave them a questionnaire asking them how would they define their, their sexuality. He asked them, have you ever had a same-sex experience or any kind of arousal <coughs> because of another man? Have you ever had an emotional crush on another man? Have you ever had a gay wet dream? Um, and so on and so on and so on. Then he got back all the questionnaires and he discarded everybody who indicated that they might have had some kind of same-sex attraction. So he was left with a group of men who defined themselves as 100% straight, never had any same-sex desires or attractions whatsoever. And then he gave them a second questionnaire, which was to ask them about their attitudes towards LGBT people. Um, what would you do if your son or daughter was gay or lesbian? Do you think that trans people should have equal rights? Um, would you work for a boss who was gay? And then again he collated all the answers. And he got rid of all the people in the middle and was left with two very extreme groups. One group said, if my daughter was lesbian I'd love her just like if she was straight. Yes, of course, gay people should have equal rights. The other group were the exact opposite. They said things like, if my daughter or son were gay, I would disown them. I'd kick them out of the house. Some even said they would kill them. Gay people should not have equal rights. They should all be locked up and they should throw away the key. So all these men described themselves as 100% straight, no same-sex desires, but one was relaxed and comfortable with gay people, the other was extremely hostile. So then what he did, he, Professor Adams then invited them one by one to come to the university and he put them in a video suite and wired them up to a plethysmograph. I'm sure you've all got one at home. <laughs> Anyone know what a plethysmograph is? It, it's a small elasticated device that goes around the penis and is wired to a computer. So when a man's penis is soft and flaccid, it's quite small. But when he gets sexually aroused and gets a hard-on, of course it grows and expands. And that's registered on the computer. So a plethysmograph tells exactly what is happening in the man's pants. Not what's in his head, but what's in his pants. So anyway, he began by showing each man heterosexual porn videos. That's, you know, porn videos of men and women having sex together. And then he rested them for a while, and then he showed them gay porn videos. And then, when he got all these men to do this exercise, he then collated the results. Among the men who said they were 100% straight, never had any same-sex desires or experiences, but were perfectly relaxed and comfortable with gay people, 
they got very strongly aroused watching the straight porn videos. A small number got some degree of arousal watching the gay porn videos. With the other group, who said they were 100% straight but were very hostile and homophobic, most of them had limited or dysfunctional sexual arousal watching the straight porn videos. In other words, they didn't get very hard, they didn't sustain their erections. But when watching the gay porn videos, 80% of those men who hated gay people, 80% got hard-ons. So the theory, or the conclusion, that Professor Adams uh, devised was that homophobia is in many cases a displaced form of homosexuality. And he quizzed some of these men afterwards, and he found that, yes, some were in total denial. Some said, oh, the computer must be wrong. You know, I, did, I, did, I never got an erection. You know, it's impossible. Others, grudgingly, under sustained questioning, did admit that they got aroused, and then said, yes, they used homophobia as a way of deflecting suspicion. They said things like, well, if I'm homophobic, my mates won't suspect I'm gay. Um, others were just in total denial. They just, just couldn't acknowledge their sexuality. So, that's a very interesting study. Um, so if you see people or hear people who are homophobic, tell them that story. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that everybody who's homophobic is secretly gay, but according to that study, 8 out of 10 are. Um, I'll just finish by saying that it's really great that you're going to be setting up um, an LGBT and allies group in the school. I think that's really important and significant. Um, lots of schools are now doing it, and they're really fun events because, first of all, you come together, you discuss the issues, but also lots of schools, they do social events. They go out to clubs, or they, they go and see films together, or they show films in the school. So I want to encourage you, whether you're gay, straight, bisexual, trans, or whatever, join up, get involved, and help change the culture of the school. Thank you. Really great speech. Is there any questions? I mean, there was questions, a contributions, criticism. <laughs> yeah. If you disagree, yeah. If anyone had any thoughts about that, I mean, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> sure, Mr. Mays. So obviously, society's moved on a lot within the last ten years. What, in your view, is still left to do? What is still left to do? <laughs> to, to, to achieve yeah. equality. Yeah. Well, quite clearly, the levels of bullying in schools and the level of hate crime on the streets is still very, very shocking. It's, quite, it's gone down, but it's still very high. Um, according to the British Social Attitude Survey just last year, still even now, nearly 20% of the British public believe that homosexuality is mostly or always wrong. That's nearly a fifth of the population. So that's quite worrying. But again, it's gone down. It used to be nearly 70%. So that's a big change, positive change. Um, there are still lots of schools that don't address LGBT issues in the classroom. So no discussion about gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, no discussion about safer sex for pupils who have same-sex relations. So there's lots of issues there that many schools need to get up to speed with. Um, there are also other issues, um, for example, um, you probably know that in 2004 the Gender Recognition Act allowed trans people to legally change their gender. And uh, that's a great, that was a great step forward at the time, but to do that they have to go through all kinds of medical supervisions and you know, pass all kinds of tests. Um, Malta, Ireland, Argentina and other countries have changed all that. They've said, a trans person should be able to self-declare, to sign a statutory declaration declaring their new gender without having to go through medical tests and all those kind of things. Um, so that's the next reform we need in this country and the government is currently consulting about that. Um, of course, still today in Northern Ireland, uh, we don't have equal marriage. 
uh, same-sex couples are still banned in Northern Ireland from getting married, even though 70% of the population support equal <coughs> marriage, uh, and even though a majority in the Assembly, before it was folded up, before it was suspended, even though a majority in the Assembly support it. For, sadly, that's because of the DUP's uh, veto. Uh, we also have an issue with uh, the blood transfusion service. Um, still today, um, it, it's true that um, gay and bisexual men cannot donate blood within three months of having sex, even if they had safer sex, and even if they've tested HIV negative. Um, now that's better than before. There used to be a lifetime ban, then it was reduced to 12 months, and now it's down to three months. But really, we need individual assessment. So. If you're a gay man in a monogamous, long-term relationship, you don't have sex with anybody else apart from your partner, or if you always practice safer sex, if you've tested HIV negative, there's no reason why you can't give blood. Um, many of you will know that um, now the HPV vaccine is being given to all young girls, uh, and in some places to young boys as well, but not to gay and bisexual men. And obviously if you're having oral or anal sex, just whether it's heterosexual oral sex or homosexual oral sex, whether it's vaginal sex or anal sex, there is a risk of passing on the HPV virus, which in most cases is harmless, but there are some strains which can cause cancer. And so there's a big push to say, well, gay men are at risk of HPV and that all gay men should also be offered the HPV vaccine. Uh, and then the final issue I'll just throw up is the issue of LGBT refugees. Um, LGBT refugees who flee persecution in very homophobic countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Uganda, Nigeria, Jamaica. Um, if they come to Britain, they will often find great difficulty in getting asylum. Um, the rate of refusal on a first interview is much higher for LGBT refugees than it is for political, religious or ethnic refugees. It's a very major culture of disbelief. So that needs to change to make our uh, asylum system fair for everyone. This question might be a bit personal, but how would you react if someone's literally homophobic to your face? Like, what would you say to them, to the at all? Well, I guess it depends how, how, how aggressively homophobic they are. You don't want to get punched in the face, but on the other hand, I mean, I always reply, and so sort of, you know, what makes you say that? You know, I, I put I put the question put a question rather than just criticising them. I put a question to them: Why do you feel that? What makes you say that? And that that begins a dialogue. And once the dialogue gets going, then you can perhaps help, help you know, get rid of or, or you know, debunk some of their their, their ideas. Um, I think it's also, yeah, it's like with any kind of prejudice. You, it's really important to challenge it, not let, not let it pass, whether it be racism or anti-Muslim prejudice, anti-Semitism, misogyny. Never let it just pass and, and leave it. Always question it, but you can do it in a way that's non-threatening. You know, Even if the person has been quite threatening in their, in, in their, their remarks, you can turn it back and, and say, you know, what made you say that? Or, Why do you think that? You know, um, that would be, be my approach. Uh, in the last couple of months of a young man um, who was banned from school from uh, performing a drag act. Have you heard about that? Have you heard about that? Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on how it was handled in terms of the aftermath of the, uh, not letting the young boy perform and how the school itself handled the situation? Yeah, I don't know the full details, but from what I've read, um, you know, it seems that, you know, this young guy, whether you agree or not, this is part of his freedom of expression. And uh, everybody else was able to perform and do what they wanted to do. Um, why shouldn't he? You know, why should someone who wants to do a drag act, uh, why, why shouldn't they be allowed to perform as if they were, in the same sense, if they were doing, you know, reciting Shakespeare or, or you know, showing a guitar or whatever? Um, I think it's about live and let live, and about accepting the right of people to express their individuality. I think a, a lot of it was you know, whipped up by a fairly small number, the opposition was whipped up by a fairly small number of very vociferous people who 
really didn't understand the issues and had a very knee-jerk reaction. Um, <clears throat> I just wondered, like, what is your stance on prejudice within the gay community itself? Because I know my friend, he struggled with actually being in the gay community because I think there's like various apps, it's like no fats, no femmes, no like whatever, like he's, they've got all sorts of lingo for like each other and do you find that's just as much of a prevalent issue as prejudice from heterosexual people to... Yeah, so you're talking about dating apps, yeah? Yeah, and yeah. like generally yeah. how like LGBTQ yeah. yeah. plus is generally with itself. Well, I don't think it's a uniquely LGBT issue. I mean, you know, on lots of dating apps, yeah. gay and straight will say, I want this type or that type, I don't want yeah. this, don't want that. But obviously we shouldn't be, if we're, if we're fighting prejudice and oppose prejudice against us, yeah. we shouldn't be reflecting prejudice on others. Yeah. So, um, you know, people's sexual, emotional, erotic desires are incredibly varied. Yeah. Um, some people really like overweight guys. Um, some people don't. Some like guys with beards, others don't. So yeah. it's all down to individual taste. Um, but I don't think you know, some of the language is, is curt, yeah. um, unnecessarily borderline abusive. Yeah. I don't think there's a place for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Could you shout? Sorry. Stand up and shout. Sorry. Have been cashing in, so at what point do you think that kind of exposure of the LGBT community leads to an exploitation of it? Yeah, you're right. Increasingly, um, pride parades are sponsored by big corporations, banks, insurance companies, the armed forces, the police, you know. Everybody's getting in on the act. Um, and in one sense, it's great because it indicates we're being mainstream. On the other hand, if you went to London Pride this year or last year, all the big floats were big corporations. And they were the big, visible, extravagant floats. The community groups were sort of relatively swamped and invisibilized by comparison. And I don't think that's the way it should be. If corporations want to fund Pride, that's, that's great. But I think you know, we have to be fairly careful, not let them take over, you know. And if, if, if corporate, interests become the main focus, then I think we're on a loser. That, that, that's not what Pride is supposed to be about. Um, when I organised the first, or helped organise the first Pride Parade in Britain in 1972, there was no corporate sponsorship. In fact, corporate sponsorship didn't happen until the late 1990s. Um, so there, were, there was more than, well, more than 20 years, almost 30 years of Pride Parade with no corporate sponsorship because businesses, governments and official institutions didn't want anything to do with the LGBT community. Now it's great that they want to be part of it, but as I said, not take over, please. You put forth the concepts that we're all on the spectrum. Could you shout, sorry? Sorry, you put forth the concepts that perhaps we're all a percentage uh, heterosexual or homosexual. Do you think if that's the case, there's no point using labels such as heterosexual? Well, I guess um, when there is prejudice, you have to name it and you have to defend your right to be. So historically, black people and Asian people have had to defend their right to be an ethnic minority, to be proud of their history, culture and heritage, and to assert their place in our society. Um, if eventually racism and homophobia and misogyny decline, then you're right in the end these labels won't matter because no one will care because everyone will treat everybody else with respect and equality. So that's to me the ultimate goal. In fact, I wrote a, an essay about 30 years ago saying my ultimate aim is the abolition of the homosexual. <laughs> By which I didn't mean the eradication or the extermination of gay people, but just the label would cease to matter in a non-homophobic society and that we could just be, we could be humans. I'll give you an example. Um, in 1976, I went to China when Mao Zedong was still alive during the Cultural Revolution. This is the height of, revolution, of the Cultural Revolution. Um, of the many things that struck me was I didn't really notice gender. Because in those days in China, everybody wore the same clothes or similar clothes. Um, most people wore blue Mao suits 
draw very, very similar cut pattern design. Some had slightly different, but you didn't, because men and women dressed the same, you didn't see gender, you just saw the person. And I thought, wow, this is a glimpse of what the future could be, where we don't see gender, we see the person. And I guess it's the same with LGBT, you know, we want to work for a society where those labels become redundant, where sexuality and gender identity just don't matter because everybody has the attitude, live and let live. Uh, there's a grow growing number of stories about people who are uh, transsexual from a, from a very young age. And my question is, do you think that parents should raise their children acknowledging their sex or being, or they should just be gender neutral? I think it's very important to listen to young people and their feelings and their, what they express. Um, given the scale of prejudice in our society, no young person would voluntarily admit, well, very few young people would voluntarily admit to being gay or trans or bisexual at an early age because they would understandably fear negative reactions and disadvantage. <coughs> so when a young person is expressing, you know, feelings that they're trans, you know, parents, siblings, schools should acknowledge and listen to that. And we should be understanding and accepting and, you know, make that person feel welcome, safe and, and included. Um, of course, you know, young people need, in those circumstances, they need counselling, support, they need to discuss these issues because many don't really understand, they know what they feel, but they don't really understand the full implications. So all that should be discussed with them. But I think we do have to listen to young people. We have to hear their voices. Do you feel that lesbian and gay stereotypes are a big problem? Do I feel that lesbian and gay stereotypes... Stereotypes what heterosexual people perhaps perceive to be just a stereotype. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of LGBT stereotypes. So if you pick up a gay, mag a gay men's magazine like Attitude or Gay Times, you will see a very stereotyped view of a gay man, usually Jim honed you know, very, very, not entirely macho, but, you know, masculine and, you know, the pecs and the abs. Um, not everybody can do that. Not everybody wants to do that. Um, of course, I've got to admit that it can be quite attractive, <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't think we should be judging people by their muscles or by their looks. I mean, character and integrity and personality are also very important. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there have been attempts recently um, with Attitude magazine, they did a series recently of um, diverse body types. You know, hairy guys, smooth guys, skinny guys, muscly guys, tall guys, short guys. You know, a whole range to try and say, this is the spectrum of the LGBT community. In the same way, it's the spectrum of the straight community. You know, we all have incredible diversity in terms of our physicality, personalities and so on. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really good to acknowledge that diversity and not be set on the stereotypes. But if you go to, you know, uh, you know a, 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 a gay uh, beauty pageant or a muscle pageant, it, it's all reacts the same, you know. And there's a place for that, and if people like it, fine. But I don't think we should be down on other people because they don't conform to that. So I've got a few pecs and abs that I'm quite skinny, so I don't really fit the stereotype, but hey, you know, I am what I am. Well, the increasing trend in schools and other institutions is to have gender neutral unisex toilets. And I think it's part of the process of breaking down these rigid barriers in terms of gender. And there's also a trend in many schools to have a single uniform for both boys and girls. And again, I, I, I'm broadly supportive of that as well. Um, I think we make too big an issue of gender. And of course, as a result, women tend to be the losers. And anything we can do to bridge that gap and have a more inclusive society, that's, that's got to be good for everyone. And ultimately, of course, with all these things, it makes for happier people. You know, if you, if you feel fully included, if your diversity is acknowledged, if you feel you have your place, then you're going to be a happier 
better, well-adjusted person. Your mental health is going to be better. Your physical health is going to be better. Um, you know, so I think we should we should really move in that direction um, and try and find a place where gender really isn't an issue. Oh, sorry. You, you, you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sure. yeah. So, um, how do you think we should tackle religions? Because you mentioned that. It's religions that can lead to a lot of this prejudice. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that you can tackle that? Because I, I can make it quite a lot tougher than just the average person. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly true that organised religion, as opposed to individual religious people, organised religion is the single greatest global oppressor of women and of LGBT people. Now, not all religious people are homophobic. I mean, Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, one of the great heroes of the anti-apartheid struggle, has always said that LGBT rights are human rights. He said, you know, he did not fight for a free South Africa to allow anybody in that society to be oppressed and disadvantaged, including LGBT people. In fact, he even went further. He said, homophobia is equivalent to racism. It's an irrational, bigoted prejudice that damages people and their lives and is damaging to the whole of society. So, yeah, it, I think it's, it's very important to... Um, work with and support progressive and liberal people in different religious traditions. So in Judaism, traditionally, Judaism was very, very homophobic. But in the last 50 years, most branches of Judaism have the liberal reformed Jews, and even some of the orthodox sects have become quite progressive and supportive, even to the point of endorsing same-sex marriage. Um, there's also quite a trend uh, in sections of Muslim communities to question the orthodoxy around same-sex relations. And a lot of it is very ill-placed. So if you actually read the Quran, there is no explicit condemnation of homosexuality in the Quran. The scholars criticize it, but if you're a Muslim, you're supposed to follow the Quran. And in the Quran it says, this is the complete word of God. It requires no interpretation, no addition at all. So I guess, you know, some people say, if you're a true Muslim, you should only follow the Quran, <coughs> and everything else is man-made. The Hadiths, the Islamic jurisprudence, it's all made by you know, mortal men. Um, and if you look at the story of Lot, uh, or Lut, in the Quran, uh, which is about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's interpreted, has historically been interpreted, as a punishment for homosexuality. But if you actually read the story in detail, the truth is that what happened was, in the story of Lut, um, um, two beautiful angels, representing God himself, came to Lot's house. And um, these are beautiful male angels. And when the men of the village saw them, they lusted after them, wanted to have sex with them. They went to Lot's house and demanded that he handed over these men, so they could basically gang rape them. These are these, these not men, these, these angels. Um, so the story is really about inhospitality, inhospitality to strangers and male rape, not about homosexuality. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole um, series of both Christian and Islamic um, analysis of this story which shows that it has been completely misinterpreted um, and that it's not about homosexuality, it's about male rape and abusive relationships with strangers. So yeah, you have to rethink the theology and it's interesting how when same-sex marriage went through in Britain in 2013 when it went through Parliament, uh, YouGov did a poll shortly before and it, YouGov poll found that 55% of people of faith in Britain supported same-sex marriage. You know, 55% of religious people in this country supported same-sex marriage. So, there is change going on, and I think we have to have dialogue, and we have to have discussion, we have to have engagement, and of course the single most important thing is for LGBT people within faith communities to come out. It's very difficult for them, uh, often, but if they come out, we know that a person who knows a gay person is much more likely to be sympathetic and non-prejudiced. So, for example, I have a Muslim friend who came out to his imam at his mosque. Initially, the imam was very hostile, 
but this guy had the, had the guts to continue the dialogue and over time that Iman's attitude has completely changed and so now he says, oh, he says I can't personally endorse homosexuality but I don't think gay people should be persecuted, I don't believe in Sharia law, killing them, um, I don't believe they should be thrown out of the mosque and in fact since then he's welcomed and supported um, three other Muslim, one lesbian and, and, and two, uh, two gay men into the mosque and he totally accepts them. So, change is afoot. Yeah. Yes, at the back? Do you think there's like a certain level of discrimination like, in the gay community, like, in terms of like, bisexuality? Do you think a lot of people say that they're not interested in Well, I totally agree with you. There is a history of biphobia in the LGBT community. And you're right. Some gay people traditionally say, oh, you're not really bisexual, you're just gay, but you can't admit it. And that quite clearly is nonsense. I mean, bisexuality is a reality, and some people are bisexual. That's just a fact of life. And of course we should accept that. You know, The whole ethos of the LGBT movement is about live and let live, about allowing people to be who they want to be. And if people are bisexual, they should be embraced as full and equal parts of our, parts of our community. Um, you mentioned Northern Ireland earlier. I'm just wondering um, what your opinion was about high and common species social conservative. How? High and common species social conservative, and whether you see it changing, catching up with England in the future. Well, to answer your question, <laughs> why has Northern Ireland been so traditionally homophobic? Um, the answer is one word, religion, uh, both Catholic and Protestant, uh, but more so Protestant than Catholic, surprisingly. Um, about 15 years ago, Northern Ireland was rated as the most homophobic place in Western Europe. The most hom So questions were asked, how would you feel about having a gay neighbour living next door to you? And the, 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 the amount of hostility from people in Northern Ireland was way, way, way above anywhere else in Western Europe. But now, it's completely reversed. As I said, 70% of people in Northern Ireland now support same-sex marriage. 70%. That's even higher than it was in Southern Ireland uh, when the referendum was held uh, a couple of years ago. So there's a lot of change going on. Um, the main problem is the DUP, the, the dominant Protestant uh, loyalist party there, which has fought every single gay rights reform for the last 40 years. Um, in fact, they had a big campaign in the 1970s called Save Ulster from Sodomy. Um, you know, when there was an attempt to decriminalize homosexuality in the North of Ireland, the DUP fought tooth and nail to try and stop it. They didn't succeed in the end, but you know, they fought. It. And they fought every other thing, you know, the right of same-sex couples to foster or adopt children, they opposed the repeal of Section 28. They opposed employment rights for LGBT people in the workplace. Uh, on every single issue, they have been oppositionists. But even within the DUP, things are starting to change, and a lot of the grassroots members do not agree with the party's policies. Uh, a party policy which has made all the more homophobic because, or hypocritical, because quite a few of the most prominent anti-gay DUP members of parliament and councillors are themselves gay. Yeah. Um, so at the beginning you mentioned how in the womb there, there might be developments that would lead someone uh, <coughs> to be, uh, to lead in either direction to be like straight or to be LGBT. Um, what are the um, like affecting factors that would like lead uh, those effects to take, uh, those things to actually take place within the womb, or is that still a mystery? Well, what happens, when a fit is in the womb, obviously they're influenced, you know, the mother's blood is feeding the fetus, uh, and the blood contains hormones, and various factors can change that hormonal balance, and um, it's, it's not, not as if, you know, 
the mother's behaving irresponsible or anything, but just about different people have different hormonal levels, you know. Um, we can be pretty much identical and for different reasons have different hormonal levels. So it's just like, I don't know, you say a, a, an accident or sort of just part of a, 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 a generic spectrum of different hormonal influences. Um, the full details are not, not, not yet entirely understood, but we know that all these things like penis size, finger ratio, auditory capacity, body mass index and so on, they all are related, at least in part, to hormonal influences in the womb and there is on average this clear differentiation between heterosexual and homosexual people. That's what we know so far. And this has, hasn't been from one or two studies, it's been dozens and dozens and dozens of studies over many years in many different countries. So I think there's a fair probability that they're accurate. Okay, um, any last questions? I've got one at the back. Yep. You mentioned Well, as I said, you know, when women don't have equal rights and respect, when there are astronomical levels of sexual violence and domestic violence against women, of course women have to assert their right to be protected and to live in safety and to have equal opportunity. So we have to respond to gender discrimination by asserting gender rights. But ultimately, once we get to that point, when we get those rights, when we get that respect, then of course the need to define will fade. But I think until then, I think gender needs to be, need, needs to be, you know, it, it is, is a factor in our society. It is something that does influence behavior and perceptions and attitudes and behavior. So we need to acknowledge that, but strive to overcome it so it doesn't be an issue in the future. We just have this. Well, it's just related to that. I was just wondering where you see transgender issues in that spectrum, because obviously, you know, in this idealized non-gendered society, would there be trans problems, i.e. people wanting to be another gender as much or at all, and whether there is a tension between um, ensuring trans rights and not reinforcing the gender divide mm -hmm. by doing that. Perhaps go back to the last question. In a sense, we're talking about a number of issues. We're talking about gender as in biological sex, gender in terms of genitals, uh, gender in terms of identity, and probably gender in terms of brain structures as well, which is an area which has not been properly researched, but there has been some research recently which suggests that trans people have different brain structures to non-trans people. But that's very preliminary use of research. It's only one study, I think, so far. So you've got all those different, those different factors. Um, at the end of the day, I think we need to um, understand that people will have a combination of some or all of those. Um, and that trans people have a particular identity based on what they feel they are or should be. Now, some people say this is delusional. That it's like saying, you know, I'm a dog or I'm a car. Well, that's not true. I mean, first of all, no trans person would willingly want to um, declare themselves given the scale of prejudice and ostracism that many of them will face. Um, so it's a, they think long and hard, and obviously it's a, it's a sincere, deeply held feeling. Um, I can remember once I challenged Jermaine Greer, who has been very dismissive of trans people. And I said to her, well look, you're just equating gender with genitals. What about the mental psychological component? And this is before the, the, the trans brain structure research had come out. And I said to her, look, you know, surely we know there are some brain structural differences between gay and straight men, between heterosexual and homosexual. Isn't it probable there will also be some brain structure differences between trans and non-trans people. Um, and she was rather thrown, but privately, she said, well, I'll have to have a think about that. 
She didn't dismiss it. Um, now, we don't want to get into stereotypes that, you know, <laughs> men are like this and women are like that, and trans are like this and non-trans are like that. But obviously, there's a constellation of factors at work. And I would suspect that their further research will show that there are brain differentials that lead people to identify as trans. And this is not delusional. This is totally sincere, totally genuine. And it's a, it's a, it's a dimension of gender which so far we as a human society have not yet understood or acknowledged. And so these social roles assigned to gender, which have been so enormously powerful for centuries, <coughs> 